John Susi, uh, a member here at Factor uh, on the board. And so if you have any questions about Factor at any time, you can, uh, you can catch up with me after, after this meeting. But tonight we're going to talk about the ESP, that's a Factor blur. Uh, sorry. We're going to talk about the ESP8266. And this is, this is not a, uh, a class in how to sit down and immediately write a big program. This is this is a high level view of what what are all the all the terms involved in even understanding how to get started with the chip, and then uh, as Bill was saying, he'll take he'll take the people that want to take it to the next level and actually load some code onto a chip. He'll do that tonight too. So this is a direction manufacturer's website. Um, it's a highly integrated chip, and what that means is in that little little tiny chip, which is which is you know super super small. Uh, when we say ESP8266, we mean that chip, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. The, the short version of all this uh, is that th that little tiny chip is a microcontroller with Wi-Fi capability and actually a whole bunch of other things all built into that tiny, tiny little package. So uh, on its own, it's actually not very useful. We have to have other parts in order to even use just that chip, right? So it has a lot of capability built into it, but you can't just take the chip out of the package and you know plug it in and turn it on, right? It needs it needs auxiliary parts. So uh, this is this is an example of a module. So whenever we work with the ESP modules, this is what I mean. I mean it has the ESP8266 chip on the circuit board, along with the parts that are required to make it operate. And oftentimes, as we'll see, not in all cases, but most times, that even includes an antenna. So that this whole thing is, is uh, now, so we've gone from this tiny little guy all the way up to a circuit board level. Well, I, I want to say all the way up, but it's actually not much bigger, uh, <coughs> um, which is handy because we can fit it into our projects really easily. Uh, but it has all the stuff that it needs all on the, all on the model. Um, so the, the boards themselves, they do not run off of five volts. Now, I don't, uh, I'm not gonna ask like, who knows what about Arduino and all this other microcontroller stuff, but generally over the years, everything has been running on five volts. And nowadays the trend is everything's gonna run on 3.3 volts. And that's been happening kind of, kind of really becoming ingrained in, in the microcontroller world, right? Of course, it's getting, it's getting lower and lower uh, going forward from here. It's gonna go probably into the mud real soon. We're working with half volt logic, right? Yeah. Is it like less volts? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. The, uh, uh, that's one. That's one of the huge draws, right? Uh, also, if you don't have to make your signal swing as high as instead of uh, going from zero to five, you only have to make your signal go up to three point three to turn something on, say for like digital digital input. Then uh, you can go faster because it, it takes a little less time to go to go up to that amplitude, right? So that's another thing. So you get you get much faster chips and circuitry, and you get much much better power efficiency when you. So we're going to see that happening a lot. And it, it makes it, as the, the next generation of devices come out, it kind of makes it tough because, like, my benchtop power supplies have always had 5 volt supplies in the bench, right? Now I have, oh, a whole bunch of 3.3 .3 volt supplies. Next I'm going to need, what, 1.8 volt supplies or some <coughs> other odd volt number, right? So I'll have to reconfigure my whole workbench to accommodate all these different voltage levels. Um, but it's very important. Whenever you're working with these chips, 3.3 .3 volts do not feed a five volt signal into this chip because you may just explode the top off, literally blow it up. Ever. Yeah, that's right. They'll let out the magic smoke, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> the magic smoke is inside the chip. That's what makes it operate. You never want to let it out. <laughs> um, so the good news for us, as as folks that want to make things with these with these modules, is that there are a handful of manufacturers. Most of them, as far as I know, are not in the U.S. right now. They're making these modules so that we can include them in our projects. Question on the power. Uh, yeah. how, how do you get uh, um, 3.3 volts other than, like, obviously you can use it on your bench, but in like a, a compact. Form. Excellent question. I don't know if everyone can hear. The question is, how do we get 3.3 .3 volts in a little tiny anything that we're making, right? So <coughs> one of the answers is you can get away with 3.0 volts. And two batteries, like if you use a double A or two or two D cell batteries, you put them end to end in series, and each one of those is one and a half volts, and then 
in series, they'll give you three volts. Or there are also off-the-shelf lithium batteries that you can get, uh, like little coin cells, the CR2032s, I think they are. Those are also three volts. So you can run these things on 3.0, even though they're rated at 3.3. But you kind of, you want to make sure that once you build out your, your product or your project or your, uh, or your design, you want to make sure that it actually runs on the three volts and that everything you connect to it also operates correctly at the three volts. Okay. Well, I was going to say that the, uh, I don't know, you know, bueno, and that is switchable between five and 3.3 volts. Okay. So the whole thing, as I understand it, you can be switched to run and operate on 3.3 volts, and then you can use that to power this, and also your outputs, I believe, would not go above that. The, the short answer is probably. I don't want to say yes. I don't know that board. Uh, so the, the question was, will this work with my my blank, my board? I have a board. Will it work with it? It says it's 3.3 volts. Whoa, slow down. Read some documentation. The only good answer that most people should give you is, if they're not 100% sure, is read, read me. If you don't know, like I don't know that particular board, I, I would say go to the website. You know, that's that's the quickest way to get the right answer. Or check the output with a voltmeter. Or, or measure it. Yeah, of course, yes. right? Measure it. As I understand, when you switch it to 3.3 volts, everything, you put output, everything, everything. operates on okay. 3.3 volts. But well, like, like you said, you want to make sure you don't blow anything up, have it, you know, set it to, to output, you know, a high on some place and measure it, see what you actually get. Yeah, yeah, so so that's a good point. You, a lot of times on the digital outputs, if you use this one of these modules, it outputs 3.3 volts. If you're feeding into a five volt device, you can usually get away with that because it's it's over two thirds of, of five volts, right? It's kind of like right on the line though. If you go down to three volts, you can get in trouble. So you always have to be careful and test everything. That's, that's the bottom line. Read, read whatever documentation you can scrounge up or, or ask the people around you, or uh, or try it. Do you have something else? Yeah, I was going to say that I I did use the O1 version with a parallax uh, PIR sensor, which was five volt, yeah. five volt logic, and I fed both five volt logic into it and it worked fine for a long time. Okay. Um, for a long I was time. reading documentation for a long time. For, for, no, yeah, until I changed that, until I changed it up to an ESP12. Oh, okay. But I was reading documentation on it, um, and it says that the that the um, GPIO pins have uh, up to six volts over volt protection on them. So there we go. Uh, if you if you look at the documentation, you may find that some of, some or all of the pins are five volt tolerant. And and uh, again, check the documentation and try it if you're, if you're really courageous. Yeah. Yeah, it's only three dollars. <laughs> so if you pull one up, it's not that big of a, a hit. Uh, okay, so so the. We start off with the, the ESP8266, and remember, that is the actual chip on the module, right? And the modules come in a variety, um, and, and they're generally named ESP and then a number. So ESP-01 is sort of the general term for uh, the, the low end of the, of, the, uh, of the ESP modules, okay? But again, ESP, when I say ESP-01, I mean the module. I don't mean specifically the chip. One of the things that I think is important to take away from tonight is the terminology, if, you, if you're coming at it from nothing. Uh, on the high end uh, of functionality, we would have the ESP12 and the 12E. They have, uh, they have a lot of IO out, uh, in and output pins, and uh, there's an analog digital converter on board, if I remember right. Um, so you can, you, and, and oh, and you are, so you can talk serial to this thing. There's a, there's a, whole, a whole lot more, as, as you see slides here. So here's, here's a list of all the different modules that are being tracked right now in this week. Uh, uh, one of the things that's very interesting with these ESP modules is that this is like kind of like Wild West territory right now. I've been, I've been doing uh, firmware development and electronic design for pretty much my whole adult life. And it, this is the first time I've ever seen a chip under $5 that will connect you to the internet. Uh, traditionally, you would buy just the chip, not on a module, for $20, $30, right? Long ago, it was 50 bucks a chip, right? But now these, these uh, ESP modules with the chip, all the extra parts on a circuit board, uh, <coughs> sometimes even with pin headers already soldered in, uh, and an antenna for $5. It's mind-blowing. So it's, it's a complete game changer as long as these things hold up and, and uh, I don't know what the FCC is going to do. 
so keep your eyes on this list. Uh, all the slides are available online, so all these lists and uh, all this terminology, you can you can follow along um, and refer to all that all the uh, all the things that I've been um, saying. This this is the ESP01 module. This is the the lowest the low. It basically has one one I/O pin, right? It has a bunch of pins that, that you'll use for programming it, for powering it, and uh, you know the reset button over here. Uh, actually, it doesn't come with a button. You have to you have to trigger the reset, right? It's, it's a little bit difficult to use at first, but it's very very simple to, to implement once you once you get over that initial bump of learning. slides later, there's a link to, to this diagram and also to where, where the photo came from so that you can get all the rest of the information on the chip. Now this is the this is the ESP 12E. Now this module has a has a metal shield on it so it's a little more robust. Uh, it'll be a little more uh, uh, a little more uh, less, a little less sensitive to interference and things like that because it'll have this massive grounded shield over it. And now you can see around the outside here those are all solder points, okay? Um, generally, there would be a pattern of pads on a circuit board like this. You would take that module, rest it on there, and, and solder it down. If you're, if you're familiar with the electronic manufacturing process, you, you could also solder paste that, set the module on, and put it through a reflow oven. Um, so this is, this is a little more advanced because you have to solder it in order to even use it. Oftentimes, when you buy these, they'll come with a, uh, a small circuit board that you can solder it down on. like the small module, uh, how this has, these are what I'm calling header pins here. These are just pins that stick off and you can poke right into a breadboard or, or any other experimenting device you have to, to easily connect it, power it, and program it, right? On the, on the ESP-12, you notice there are none. There, there are no, no, no easy hookups. But when the, on the little, they call it a breakout board, on this breakout board, you solder that chip down, and then you can put in headers into those holes. Then you can plug things onto it and program it, power uh, This is actually a board I designed here. And it looks big on the screen, but it's not really that big. And this is the ESP12 module soldered onto the center. I, I'll, I'll have this running and I'll, I'll have it uh, do demos tonight after, after this little talk. Any questions before I move on? So that covers all the hardware. So we're not going into all the details of how to actually physically connect it from this little little talk here. But now we have the hardware, and we can we can plug our, our computer our programming computer our laptop to this board and actually send a program into this chip. And it's uh, to draw an analogy, you can think of it like a real computer, although it's, of course it's not, right? Uh, but you can load your program into this chip, and every time the chip turns on, it runs that program. Top to bottom, over and over and over, forever. Uh, so if you if you have your program monitoring um, a wire that's connected here, if something happens on that wire, do something over on this side, then that, that program will run in this chip whenever it's under power, and it will it will do that all the time. Um, the only thing is it doesn't it doesn't have Windows or or, or any other user interface, right? So it, so, so that's the, the term firmware is uh, would be uh, what we use to describe the program. We Sorry, John, did you just want to mention some of the different 
things you have on that slide in different ways. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, sorry. I thought I was kind of getting jabbered. I think this is important. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so there are a lot of, there are actually a handful of ways to communicate with the chip and to program the chip to talk to the chip. It has a built-in serial port, so you can you can just send it, I don't know how many uh, are, are familiar with the old board. Board of AT commands, right? You can, you can just hook a serial port to that thing, send it some commands, and configure it to different modes, have it do the, the Series of automatic built in responses, right? Because of the, uh, the firmware that comes with stock from the manufacturer. Two things here that I'm not really familiar with uh, Node GUA and Node MCU. Um, I think Bill knows a little more about this than I do. Well, they, you're, you're talking about using the Lua programming language to program the chip. Yeah, so my understanding is that you can use this Lua scripting language as a sort of easy way, maybe, to, uh, to load software into the chip. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have too much more to say on that because it's kind of like, I don't really feel that's the strength of these things. So I didn't really focus on it too much. Um, there are, in my eyes, there are there are two important ways to interact with this chip and program it. One is bare metal. And that means writing the program in C, compiling it specifically to, to execute on this chip, and then downloading it to the chip. That's the hard way, right? Then there's the easy, easy way, which is option two, and which is what we're going to show everybody because it's, it's a fantastic way to, to get into this really quickly and not have it overcomplicated. And that's treat it like it's an Arduino. Um, without taking too much of a detour, Arduino is an easily programmable uh, microcontroller development board that's, that's roughly this big. And some clever folks figured out how to make these ESP modules act like they're Arduino boards. So we can use uh, a gigantic library of free and open source software to program these chips to do all kinds of really great things. And that's what I think is worth learning, especially as a, as a beginner. Um, so there's this list of specifications. And hiding in that list, it says integrated low power 32-bit CPU could be used as application processor. And that sounds like a big mouthful, but what it means is you can give it programming code, and it'll just run. It doesn't have to. Uh, it doesn't have to be in any specific language. Or like, well, I'm sorry. It doesn't have to be in some kind of uh, esoteric or weird language. It's just C, right? You just program the thing in C. And so, so the people that figured out how to uh, port all of this programming knowledge over to the Arduino world, they have a they have a website. I think it's ESP8266.com.org, or someone help me out here, sorry, <laughs> .com, ESP8266.com. That's actually where almost all this stuff is referenced from, so you'll find, you'll stumble across it if you click in any of the links in the, in the slides. So, the, the folks there have uh, put together a, a whole instruction set on how to, how to set up your Arduino environment to directly program this chip. So all you need is, uh, let's see, yeah, it's a mind if I borrow this? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is not very complicated. It's a USB cable, and this is just a USB to serial converter. Uh, and these things are commodity costs these days. They're, they're, they're almost free, they're so cheap, right? So with very little cost, you can get involved and have an entire world of possibility open up to you. This is the size of the uh, ESP module. This is a this is a 12, not a 12E. And you can tell because across the top here it's missing, I shouldn't say missing, it doesn't have the same number of pins as a 12E has, it's a little bit less. But this board here is the, the Adafruit Mazaha board. Uh, not a spokesperson for Adafruit or anything, but this is like $10. <laughs> so it's hard to say, don't just go get one. Um, so this has this, this, when you get this, it has the module soldered onto already, so you don't have to fuss around with trying to solder all those little pads and all that jazz, you know? You can just get this, hook it up to your USB port, and program it. Question? Might be a little off topic, but you mentioned stock firmware a few times. Yeah. Is, is the chips kind of like routers where you can get like a custom firmware for it and it does different things, or is it kind of like you're stuck with one thing and that's it? Yes. So, uh, did, did anyone not hear the question? The, uh, the answer, is, as far as I know, is yes. It comes with a stock firmware. And when I talk about bare metal programming, that would be you, re you write your own firmware and send it, and you would overwrite whatever it came with from the factory. Okay. Um, now, beyond that, this Arduino integration is a new firmware that understands how to process the Arduino code that you write. So you write the Arduino code in the Arduino uh, IDE, and when you hit compile, 
with, uh, with Bill about learning to actually program these things. You'll see just how simple it is. So I, I hope I impress that upon everyone. Don't be intimidated by these things. Yeah, they can do an awful lot, but you can also do an awful lot pretty easily. So here are the steps. Um, I keep saying, you know, use Arduino, use Arduino. Um, and, and this is the this is the, this is the this is the procedure to do that. First, you start by downloading the Arduino software, you install it, and within the Arduino environment, in the IDE as it's called, uh, which is Integrated Development Development Environment, right? So anyway, fancy words for the window on your screen. There's a Tools option, and you click on Board Manager, and you tell it, I'm using. You select it right. Uh, it's actually as easy as selecting from the list. I'm using the ESP module. And for most purposes, you can pick generic ESP if you just buy them. Uh, there's also a special entry for this particular board, so you can pick that one from the list. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a short list of options out there. You just tell it which board you're going to use. Um, I have written a couple of examples that I, I based off of the, uh, the yeah, ESP8266.com examples. Um, I just I added a little bit of a web page to one of them, so uh, so that it can show how easy it is to to even interact right through the browser to turn turn an LED on or off. It's, it's really really fast. Um, so those examples are available. You can download those. Uh, you'll, the only other tool, like I was saying earlier, is you, you know this USB cable. But the special part is uh, on this one. It's this USB to 3.3 volt serial. As I was saying, they're not they're not terribly expensive. And then again, remember these things are 3.3 volts. <laughs> well, there's a lot of 5 volt stuff out there, and it's really easy to just grab something from the parts bin and plug it in. Yes. How much do they have? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a little a little open to discussion, but Mike has had great luck with plugging things into the ESP01 module and not one. Because that IO pin seems to be five volt tolerant, and in fact, he was saying up to six volt tolerant, and that's sort of common practice um, in the microcontroller world to have s at least some pins that are five volt tolerant, right? Um, but if you can try to design for three point three from the from the get go, um, it'll just make your life a little bit easier. But yeah, when you have to get into shifting between three point three and five, and it's situation dependent, right? Sometimes it's a real hassle. But to answer your question a little more directly, uh, the, the, the rumor is that they're probably pretty tolerant. Uh, at this point, it's it's a it's kind of hard to get documentation. Yeah, the serial number was like four volts. It has nine volts. Okay, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm just want to jump back to the very beginning here. Um, so this. ESP8266, right? The, the company is Espresso, E-S-P-R-E-S-S-I-F. -E -S -S they're, um, I guess they're a fabulous semiconductor maker. So they, they make the, the, they design the chip internals, but they do not fabricate it themselves. I guess they subcontract it out or something like that, right? Um, but what's interesting is that the documentation is, is so hard to find. Find it in Chinese, um, but I've been in contact with them, trying to find out where do I buy the chips from. Like I want to buy thousands of these things and put them on boards, right? Where do I buy them from? And they, and they said, oh, you just buy them direct. But they're working on getting uh, distributors in the U.S. here. So there are a few big, big, big names that uh, hopefully they'll all become distributors. Um, so with with these chips, when you go for documentation. Try to remember, just go to esp8266.com. Start there, and that will launch you to other places. There's a, uh, there's a that brings you to the forum, and at the top of that web page, there's a link to Wiki. If you click on that, that's like it's their Wikipedia, right, uh, of, of the chip. So, um, tons and tons of information. There. Anybody else have any questions? That's that's about all I have. Did yes. you see any mention anywhere about what the core processor is? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> I got the feeling from when I drilled down today, yeah. it was a little bit different than you just said. I think maybe the ESP folks actually make something. They buy intellectual property for a core from
from okay. somebody that traces back to MIPS. So I think oh. it maybe it's a California outfit that okay. has intellectual property, and I think it's a maybe a MIPS process. Yeah. <laughs> See, we're writing the documentation as we go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, that's what's going on. Okay? You want to, um, I can just show one last thing, uh, just to show the speed of these uh, of these modules. I'll power this up here. I have two AA batteries. I didn't, uh, didn't make a screw terminal, so I just have to plug these in real quick. It'll, it depends upon your Wi-Fi network. You know? um, <coughs> It'll do WPA or WPA2. WPA, WPA, I guess, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not actually a Wi-Fi expert. Do <laughs> you have to program that into your code? Yes. 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 Your SSID and your, and your passcode. You don't actually have to tell it what security under certain firmware. Right. It's smart yeah, enough to figure so it out. I believe it's uh, 802.11, uh, ABG, and N. Yeah, you actually have that all on the slide. Yeah, we're not even we're not even telling it what kind of security. We're just telling it the SSID and the password, and that's enough. Uh, you know, all that. All you, the, you can put in the bands and stuff, right? I do believe. Like that's something you can put in. If that's something you can probably, like, but like it automatically finds it most of the time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a robust little chip. It, it, things happen fast, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this how these are used over the next couple of years, actually. And it can act, it can, uh, act as an AB. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't even mention <laughs> this. This chip can be uh, this. What you saw was, of, of course, it gave a server, right? And that's just a client on a Wi-Fi network. It's just another, just another laptop, right? It can also be an access point. You can configure this chip as an access point, and then uh, select the Wi-Fi network that you connect to. So I do this, and I say, right now, I'm telling my laptop to connect to Factor. If I had generated a Wi-Fi network with this chip, which is when I put it into access point mode, I can connect directly to it without even using the Wi-Fi around it. I can talk directly to the chip. So that's another option. And I don't know how many clients it support simultaneously, but I can't afford four, four, four clients simultaneously. Um, so it's not even just limited to just one connection. Some of the documentation said it can be a, an access point and a client. And a client so, yeah. simultaneously, yeah. so you can do Wi-Fi mesh network. Yeah, that's bridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. I, the, so, the, so the little chip itself apparently was was uh, was made as a, a serial to Wi-Fi bridge chip initially, and then all of a sudden someone said, "Wait a minute, we can do much more with it." However, that chain of events goes. It's probably on the web somewhere in the real history. But they said it in Chinese. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all of course it'll be in Chinese, right? <laughs> 
thanks a lot, John. And, right. and as I said, we're going to move to you know, bring up in smaller groups. So.